Taking Great Pictures, Part 2. Original photos by Katherine P. Fulford. That's me. Format. Choose a main point of interest for your photo. Here, in Slovenia, of course the castle and the cave is the main point of interest, and your eye is drawn to it. Here's another shot. Not so good. What's that chef doing under her arm? Move around to get a better shot. Much nicer, with the tree as part of the picture. Try moving from the middle. Here's a nice shot, balanced by the heavy buildings on the side in Switzerland. Here's a shot of my husband in Belgium. It's right in the middle. Not so great. Try moving it for a better effect. And here we have a very different look at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Not so straight on. More of an angle shot. Also, check whether you should shoot horizontal or vertical. Here's a shot. Makes a nice picture of the front of this building, but the building was magnificent, so all I had to do was turn my camera upright and got the whole thing. Try adjusting your angle. Shoot down sometimes. It's great to try to go to the highest point of the city to see the view. Here are some scenes from Italy, from Switzerland, and Slovenia. Also, try adjusting your angle and shooting up. This is me lying down on a lounge chair to take this shot. There we are at the Great Wall of China. And here I am, shooting up at the front of this beautiful cathedral in Russia. And even at a local circus, you can get great shots shooting up. Try also adjusting your angle on a Dutch tilt. Here's an interesting shot in the small country of San Marino. Look what happens when I turn it on its side. A lot of fun. You can also adjust your perspective Holding your camera behind someone's shoulders gives you a perspective that they might have. It's like sneaking into their thoughts. Also use leading lines. These are lines that lead your eyes into or throughout the picture. See how the line of the building curves around? To achieve this, stand at the beginning of the curve. Allow for breathing room or walking room. Here we have a person at the very center of the picture. If we move this back, it allows what we call breathing room. It makes the photo more comfortable. Here's another example. The woman is centered in the picture. Look what happens when we take in more of the context and allowing her a little bit more space in front, setting her at the back of the picture. Here's another example. See the nice breathing room. It's based on the angle of the face. This one doesn't need as much because his face is not turned completely sideways. Here's another one that's a full profile. And with the arm out, you want to put plenty of room in front of the face. Here's another picture demonstrating walking room. The same concept, but just with legs. This is a moose in Denali National Park in Alaska. Now that you've learned about breathing room, let's learn how to take better portraits. I've had my friend take a series of photos so you can see how to improve your photographs. This looks like many photos taken for a newsletter. Not very good, is it? I wouldn't be proud to have myself in there, and that is me. First of all, there's too much headroom in this photograph. You need to move the camera, but there's still problems. One of the things wrong with it is my clothes don't look very good. My shirt is all bunched up, my necklace is hidden. I have a low neckline and it doesn't look very professional. Let's see what we can do about that. There, that's better. Improved neckline, and my hands are crossed, but there's stuff in the background now. It's much better to take it on a blank space. This is better. Uh-oh, my shirt's peeking out, and my hair's in my face, and that's not a really good smile. We need to fix that. So what we do, we ask the person we're taking a picture of, may I fix your hair? How about if we tuck in that shirt? You're the one that's supposed to notice everything as the photographer. If you notice, I've turned slightly sideways. So I'm facing at an angle with my head turned back, but it makes much more professional picture than the first one that just looked like a mugshot. This one's even better. A much bigger, brighter smile and zoomed in a little bit. Both are good, though. This is what you're trying to achieve. Watch what happens when you change the focus on your camera. Here's a setting that allowed our central figure of the flower to be more focused than the outside leaves. And here's one that happened by accident because of all the humidity in China. Beautiful with the background less focused. Stunning, in fact. 
and here's one with a soft focus on a flower. You can also show scale for more interest. Here's a tiny little weaving. I wanted people to understand how small it was by holding my hand up. The macro world is wonderful. Look at nature, so brilliant in color, even at a gas station in Georgia, or an ancient drawing on the wall of a cave in Italy, or something that looks like a conquistador carved into a rock, or a plant, or a bee, a frog, or a little tiny pygmy rattler. Even a mosquito can be interesting when he lands on a mirror. Tiny little white crab in Malaysia. Interesting flowers. Color can also be amazing, whether it's just in people's shirts or in a room. Wow, look at this building. Wonder what it's like inside. Wow. You find bright colors everywhere. And here's a beautiful window in Lugano, Switzerland, as well as this window in Spain and another in Charleston, and colorful balloons in Lima, Peru, and sunsets can be really different here at our house in Florida. Wow! <laughs> the next subject is light. It's one of my favorite subjects because it can be so interesting and change the look of things. It's best when you can use natural light. Look how beautifully this natural light lights the woman's face who is doing the embroidery and another in China, and one of my little cousin in a playroom, another in Africa with a campfire. You can use available light. Here in Africa, these beautiful protea with the light of a candle and a mask in a museum in Belgium, and an aquarium light in Vancouver are all of these lovely shots, starting with the tiniest of jellyfish until they grow bigger and bigger. You can also try silhouettes when you think of light. Having the light behind the subject creates a silhouette. Here's one using the light of the fountain to make a silhouette of the central statue. You can also try night shots. These are a lot of fun and can be quite beautiful. Here's one of the Cirque du Soleil when I was in Copenhagen and of the Eiffel Tower and of some beautiful lights in Beijing, China and Shanghai and at my river house our little L'Enfant raccoon. And here's a beautiful scene in Sicily, again on film in the 1970s. And also a beautiful Egyptian scene right in the middle of Madrid. And here we have Waikiki and Rio de Janeiro and Kuala Lumpur. And again, this is perhaps my favorite night shot of Budapest, Hungary. Another thing that's important with light is to understand your flash. You can see in this picture Without a flash, you lose a lot of color. Adding the flashback, there you go, all the colors of the pizza. Sometimes you don't want to use flash and you want to have natural light. This allows you to get the best photos of stained glass. You also want to avoid what's called backlight. Instead, you want to either use fill flash or move. Fill flash is when you turn on your flash in situations that you normally wouldn't think to. This is a good example of where you should use fill flash. Turn on your flash here because it's so bright outside you can't see the face properly. Or you can ask your subject to move outside. Watch the quality of the light. It particularly changes early in the morning and late in the evening. Here's a perfect example of the sun going down in Africa. This is where the penguins live. Here's another in Germany, again in the evening. But here's another quality of light. This was getting later in the afternoon, but still plenty of light to see. Beautiful, brilliant colors in New Mexico. And here's one I took with film a long time ago. This is in Florida. This is moving into the night, but the sky was an incredible blue. Here's another one with haze. Haze can be your friend sometimes. can make pictures difficult, but you can also get some pretty ones. This was absolutely beautiful. The sun was hitting just right on the beautiful blonde hair of this young woman in a park. It's fun to play with the position of light. Normally, as a photographer, you should have it behind you and light the faces of your subject. However, there are times when you can reposition yourself to take a great photo. 
This is an astronomical observatory in Machu Picchu. Almost everybody walked around it, even though the guide explained what it was, and walked away. I instead, though, found out how to get the sun exactly in position so I could get a great shot. This is in Estonia. I love the way the light lit up the scene of the little house, kept the shadows in front for a frame. Another fun thing to do is to play with shadows. This was fun in the desert. My husband and I noticed we had very, very long shadows at this time of day. Here's another beautiful shadow picture. This is a lamp in South Africa, and you can see the beautiful patterns on the wall. So you can learn to shoot in the light. Now some cameras have a difficult time doing this, while others do it quite well. Here's an example of not shooting into the light. This is a beautiful scene near the end of the day, but I waited till we got just in the right position and I made a different shot. You can see what happened with the rainbows and the stars. Here's another example on the Amazon, and another one up in Lake Titicaca. Because Lake Titicaca was high in the mountains, I got some beautiful pictures at this time of day. This one particularly with the llamas coming home, and this one with some metal sculptures on top of the roof. You can tell I like to do this. Here's another one in Malaysia. Another thing is to take advantage of the circumstances. Instead of crying about the rain, look what you can do with it. Look at this beautiful picture. This is Chinatown in Penang, Malaysia. Wonderful shots. Such a different look than a normal night. Another thing you can do is experiment. You can tell a story, for example. You can take a picture of something like a brochure and a map. And next thing you know, you're at the Tour de Suisse in Lugano, Switzerland. Here you have one of the riders, them leaving the ramp, and you follow through with several pictures in a sequence. Here we are celebrating with champagne. This is one of the funniest sequences. Do you know how to get your sheep home when you live in Peru? You take a taxi, of course. It takes a lot of people to put those sheep in a taxi. Ah, oh, but it's finally done. Off they go. It's also fun to stop motion with your camera and choose a fast shutter speed or the correct motion symbol on your camera. There's a beautiful hummingbird in Florida, a butterfly in an arboretum, an airplane, a water fountain, or this beautiful water wheel down in Brazil, a gorgeous fountain in Toronto with a light. Perfect. You can also capture from video. This is one of the best ways to stop motion, especially when you don't have much light. Here are a couple of pictures from a Chinese opera captured from video. Here are some from a flamenco dance in Granada, Spain. This was particularly low light and the only way to get these good shots. And here we are in Africa, very late, almost dusk. And these, without video, we wouldn't have been able to take it all. I tried on my camera. Here's a porcupine being stalked by a lion, and this is what happens next. Another series of pictures that I learned to take this way was of my students when they graduated. Impossible to take in individual shots, so I just did video and then went back and captured them afterwards. And last but not least, do what others don't do. I guess when it comes to taking pictures, I do almost whatever it takes to get the picture. Here's an example. Elizabeth Taylor was in Russia when I went there in 1975. I waited for hours to get a good shot, while all of my friends complained that I was being rude. Of course, I didn't say a thing to her. I just sat and waited until she finished dinner. When she came out later, I asked her if I could take a picture. She said, certainly, sweetie, and let me take her picture and posed for me. Immediately, everybody else wanted the shot. Funny, they never got it. Here's another situation. Shaka Khan. Isn't this a great shot? Boy, that's a funny story. There was a big, tall guy that was about to go through the huge crowds to get up to the front to take a shot. So I just followed him along and said to everybody, excuse me. And we made our way all the way up to the front. And Macy Gray was also there. So it's worth it if you want to take good pictures and have a lot of fun. Aloha, and this is the end of part two taking great pictures.